<clears throat> so, um, uh, retrospectives. Um, so yesterday we kicked off the boot camp with um, a set, a diverse set of material. We spent the first little bit of the boot camp after the orientation uh, talking uh, about a model. You know, we explored a model which, like all models of this sort, captured a sort of theory, uh, in this case, the theory of personhood that was particularly austere, particularly simplistic, involving people progressing between susceptible, infected, and recovered states, um, being able to get infected by others who are located next to them, and being able to expose others to infection next to them. And those individuals, um, and, and that theory captured mechanisms. It captured particular pathways by which things could happen, that someone could become immune either by going, starting susceptible, getting infected, and then recovering, or they could become immune through vaccination. Both of those were shown. It was a mechanistic model, we sometimes say, a model that, that characterizes the pathways by which things change, that char characterize the underlying situation. But beyond that, and I gave the analogy to critical realist thought, it, it beyond mechanism, it captured context, context in the form of an environment in which these agents situated uh, were situated. And I later noted that agent-based modeling has long prized and arguably given privileged status to um, this idea that important system behavior arrives from interaction between agents and interaction of agents with the environment. And here agents were interacting with other agents who were situated next to each other, north, south, east, and west. And I think in that case also um, you know, northwest, uh, northeast, uh, southeast, and southwest as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so we could have agents influence each other. And uh, because of that, an agent infected at the beginning in an otherwise susceptible, susceptible um, set of agents could lead to a waves of infection propagating outwards. And we saw that this model exhibited some properties that I ascribe to complex systems more generally. Complex systems are these these systems where the whole is greater than some of the parts. Um, these systems where to understand its behavior, you can't reduce it to any one, any one piece or the average of what's going on with pieces. There's some phenomena at a higher level that results from the interactions. Complex systems are all about interactions, not about the pieces. And it can give rise to behaviors that are intriguing um, scientifically, but more germane to public health. It gives rise to behaviors that can surprise us when we try to formulate health interventions, health policies, health programs, because emergence almost by definition surprises us. It, it's, it consists of behavior at a higher level that we wouldn't have anticipated from any of the pieces, just like the behavior of a traffic jam can't be reduced to the car engines and axles and, and, and tire sizes and so on. And when it surprises us in the sphere of public health, it's often in the form of, of intervention efforts that don't give the results anticipated. They may work at cross purposes uh, to other interventions. They may may yield disappointing results. In some cases, they may actually yield adverse results. Like when the US sought to reduce the damage done by smoking by, by putting a big emphasis on low tar cigarettes, which was designed to ensure that those smokers out there 
would be exposed to fewer carcinogens or less carcinogen load, but it ended up discouraging people from quitting a lot of the time. They thought they could keep smoking with lower tar cigarettes and secure health benefits without the the uh, uh, distress that that often comes with going through withdrawal when when quitting smoking altogether. And it probably undercut efforts to get a lot of people to quit. And it's generally regarded as a as a mistake, as a big policy emphasis to emphasize low tar cigarettes. So when we when we're dealing with complex systems, we get surprised and uh, we get surprised by the outcomes of our attempts to intervene. In complex systems, intervening at one place, maybe in a physician's office where they may prescribe opioids for chronic pain management pops out in other places as well. It may pop out in emergency room presentations. It may pop out in what the criminal justice system um, uh, is dealing with in terms of dealer activity or in terms of um, in, of incarcerated individuals for dealing. Uh, it pops out in terms of police responses to deliver naloxone. These are systems which are complex to deal with. They're entangled and they surprise us in their behavior. We poke in one place and we often get surprising behavior in other places. We seek to, to deal with troubling infections by rolling out new frontline antibiotics and we find the bugs bite back, right? We find that the bugs adapt to the new antibiotics and we find that new antibiotic resistance strains of bacteria evolve, which drive us to new drugs. And, and this is the characteristic of complex systems, whether it's in climate change issues at the intersection of, of social issues and in, in health, such as substance use and mental health issues and issues uh, such as involving um, adolescent, uh, adolescent mental health and digital devices, um, or suicide prevention and self-harm, um, intimate partner violence. These are all areas that are gnarly in part because they're sprawling. They involve many actors and interventions in one place or changes in one place can ripple through the system and pop out whack-a-mole like in many areas of the system and where interventions that are misaligned or unbalanced can end up being diluted, defeated, uh, or, or actually sometimes do net harm. We call them policy resistant systems. So when we're dealing with these systems, these systems which are, are, are um, dynamically complex, where the whole is greater than the sum of parts, we have to be more judicious. We have to be more um, thoughtful in how we depict them. If we want to solve the problem of eating weights, we have to look beyond the emergency room. We need techniques that will depict the system more broadly. If we want to understand food systems and how to get nutritious, healthy uh, food to individuals, uh, at a time that's that's affordable, easily accessible, no matter where their point of these individuals on the socioeconomic spectrum, we have to think about a broader system. If we're dealing with antimicrobial resistance, if we're dealing with intimate partner violence, if we're dealing with issues of substance use, we, we need to be considering a broader system and we need to be considering that system in terms of its complex behavior, how if you poke in one place, it pops out otherwise. And the model we started with last time, I designed to try to show this to you in a graphical way, because the model itself depicted a descriptively simple situation, a rather simple, simplistic um, depiction of, you know, a susceptible infected and recovered status of an individual transmitting just the people next to them in some stylized space. But what we saw is that it could give rise to behaviors that were actually quite complex visually, quite, quite involved. 
and it exhibited emergence. It exhibited these, these waves of infection, this concentration of infected people on the for, on the outside of this, these waves. We saw that we could get multiple waves of infection or not, depending on the kind of relative timing of when people recover or when people lose immunity. There were cases, although we didn't explore it, where the infection would die out entirely and some where it would take off. And so it exhibited tipping points, points where the qualitative behavior of the system changes dramatically um, at a certain point. Systems like that can be descriptively simple. It's not a matter of them being complicated necessarily, but they can be complex in a dynamic sense, in the sense that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And we're dealt to deal with these systems as the most difficult challenges in society, because those are the ones that resist more easy addressing. They're the ones that require coordinated action, action that's not merely systematic, but systemic in its thinking. And modeling is, is one of uh, the most effective tools for that. I often analogize modeling uh, as uh, Winston Churchill, for all his faults, commented about democracy. He once said, democracy is the worst of all forms of government, except for everything else. And I think modeling is the worst of all forms of working to try to uh, assist us with public health challenges, except for everything else. It's it's one of these tools that has many limitations, uh, but it's one of the best tools we have in our toolbox to help equip us to work with these complex systems. Now, we saw with that complex systems some other principles as well, beyond emergence and tipping points, which you know, going from a set of successive waves to just one wave where it died out. And we could have easily seen situations with no waves. We also saw a principle of structure drives behavior. And I tried to use this to deal with the pernicious misconception that a model is just a bunch of data and you put any data in, you can get anything out. And it's there's so much wiggle room, you know, you can use a model to show anything in the world. And, and, and that's not true, it's based on a misunderstanding. It's also based on misunderstanding to conflate the model with the data that went into it. So um, during my secondment, uh, I was working with uh, a colleague who um, was from a different area of the health system, and he really, really wanted to look at the model. And I was glad to show him the model. But um, it became clear that his idea of the model was, okay, show me the data. Um, I just want to see the data and that whole, that is the model. And I told him, no, models, models are not just about data. In fact, their structure is a lot more significant than the data. Um, the data, as I said yesterday, it, it nudges a model within its areas of possible behaviors. A model has certain possible behaviors associated with it um, that are possible, and it will it'll exercise certain of those behaviors. But often its structure rules out broad classes of behavior. You know, in that model, unless, you know, that original model was susceptible to people becoming uh, recovered, or excuse me, becoming infective on exposure, and then becoming recovered and having that permanently, you're never going to see the number of recovered people go down. And you're never going to see the number of susceptible people go up. Um, there are certain invariants, regularities that are inviolate in models. That's a pretty simple example, but when we have more sophisticated models, there's lots of things that are possible and lots of things that are not possible. And the data will kind of nudge it into one type of possible behavior or another, but within those bounds. Beyond that, with that model, we saw that we could take the same basic model and run it with different 
what if questions involving its data, um, involving the assumptions in it. And we saw we could encode those assumptions in this particular software with parameters. You remember that? We, we, um, we would set different values to the parameters and run them all. Same basic structure, but we're trying to see its implications over time with this set of parameters or that set of parameters and that set of parameters. I argued from this floor that models are useful in and of themselves for stimulating uh, discussion, for drawing out knowledge, for drawing out understanding, um, for drawing out competing understanding of a system and arriving at some better collective understanding, um, some better understanding of the different perspectives on a given issue. Models are very, very useful for this. But what made that model particularly useful is that we could enact it, we could run it. And by running it with different parameter values, we could see behavior that differed. And um, it differed within the range of what's possible for the model. Um, and so we had a bunch of scenarios. We And any logic, the name for them is experiments. And they are... Um, they are a key tool in our toolbox when we're working with these models. So I'll, I'll just remind you what they look like uh, over, over here. Uh, and so if we had a model, uh, we will go back to that very first model that we opened. And you'll see a bunch of uh, scenarios uh, when this comes up. And those scenarios... Uh, basically exercise the model with different particular assumptions. And regardless of whether it's in any logic or other frameworks, we commonly have these scenarios to kind of characterize model behavior under different circumstances. The model structure stays the same, but the particulars of the results will be different. Because models have not only mechanism, and context, but also outcome. And we saw it yesterday that often with agent-based modeling, we summarize the behavior of a model um, at an aggregate level, even though or, or we, we, in addition to, to looking at its behavior at an individual level, following particular individuals, as Wade described in his presentation late in the day on models for individual level storytelling, we also look at um, chosen aggregations of, of model state that summarize the, uh, the situation with a model. So up here at the top of this, um, uh, at the top of this model, we had a graph here, which was depicting over time the number of people who were uh, uh, in different status, uh, susceptible, infected, and recovered. This was a summary. And with agent-based models, we have a much more detailed underlying situation. Each person here is in one of three states, susceptible, infected, recovered. But often we will summarize it up at a high level for some overall statistics. And one of the powers of agent-based modeling is we can choose how to summarize it very flexibly. If you want to summarize it according to five-year age categories, Prevalence and five-year age categories, no problem. If you want to do so with two-year age categories, no problem. If you want to divide the first five years into six-month categories, no problem. If you want to characterize it by, you know, number of individuals who have had this history of, um, of encounters with the care system, you can do that. Uh, and you can slice and dice it as you see fit from an age-based model. Um, this is in contrast to aggregate models where the the um, so-called stratification, the kind of rules by which we distinguish people are more or less fixed in model structure. Um, so we're working with this initial model to learn some principles. And I, I talk more, a little bit more about those principles subsequently. And I noted 
how this initial model exhibited some of these features of, of complex systems. So uh, it, it had, it exhibited feedbacks. Um, uh, so one individual infects uh, another, which leads to a further spread of infection, which leads to more people getting infected, et cetera. Some of those feedbacks are feedbacks at an individual level. Some of those feedbacks are, are sort of higher level constructs that we, we use to summarize the model. We also saw here that we, we have in these features um, uh, associated with Asian uh, interagent interactions, there were nonlinearities. There was no spread of infection unless there was both a susceptible and an infected. You, you need to consider both of these and without both, there's none. And it turns out that is a nonlinearity. But some are, some are um, there, there's often many nonlinearities often associated with, for example, policy gain from certain types of interventions. And it turns out this model exhibited those too, although I didn't dwell on it. There's localized effects. Agents are infecting others nearby. Um, and uh, there, there were some delays, delays associated with recovery, delays associated with, with loss of immunity. And from this emerged a set of properties, um, emergent properties, tipping points. Uh, although we illustrate it with another model later, uh, we often see path dependence and lock-in effects. I don't know if you remember that in that later model, but if we started with two clinics up front, we could, or sorry, three clinics up front, we could head off an outbreak that would, that would otherwise be very large. Um, but if that outbreak started and then we brought three clinics in, we had surge capacity brought in, to respond to the already established outbreak, three clinics weren't nearly enough. It locked into a state where we needed a lot more effort to escape it. Um, we, we also have often different effects at scale. You may have, for something like COVID-19, um, or uh, you, you might have um, different effects within schools for how infection is spreading in long-term care facilities than at the neighborhood level, than at the city level, or than at the regional level. And uh, I had mentioned policy resistance as one of these most vexing and most motivating um, features of complex systems. They often resist effective management that's not based on really judicious approaches uh, informed by complex systems um, uh, methods. So policy resistance is um, this tendency of a system to dilute, delay, or otherwise thwart, um, um, render um, ineffective, or even um, reverse gains that you, you might expect through intervention. Uh, and uh, it's, in the cards when we're dealing with complex systems. There's some very interesting experiments that have been conducted using behavioral economics principles um, with uh, people with complex systems. So that first model we used yesterday, that very simple model of SIR, I argued it was descriptively simple, but it gave rise to complex behavior. Um, so there are these, these experiments that uh, I know a bunch of them that were run at MIT, but I don't think that's unique for where they've been run. Um, there may have been some at Albany as well. I'm having trouble remembering, maybe in the Netherlands. But where they set individuals up with um, descriptively simple complex systems. They give them a task that was descriptively simple, but exhibited these features of complexity. Agent agent interactions, for example, with ordering behavior of a real tail outlet, a, 
a wholesaler, a distributor, and a manufacturer, for example, your four agents. Um, or people trying to manage an emergency room and, and the crowding in the emergency room and wait times in the emergency room and, and handle the beds and the movement of people into the wards. Um, you set people up with these experiments. Um, and even those who are the most highly skilled STEM graduates, science, technology, engineering, and math at MIT, they had you know, PhD students who who were pursuing mathematically um, uh, mathematically deep areas of of research might have been in mathematics, might have been in in areas of engineering, and they would set them up with these descriptively simple problems and ask them to try to to try to work with these systems, to try to manage the systems um, based on their intuition based on their understanding, based on their analysis, but without help of the model. And what was discovered quite consistently across these was that even the most highly educated individuals are terrible about managing complex systems. You can stick me in front of a complex system. I spent my the last 30 years of my life working with complex systems. You stick me in front of one um, to operate it manually, I'll be terrible. That's about everyone you know. You stick Einstein in front of them, they'll be terrible. Because we're just not set up with our wetware to, to learn how to manage these systems. It's, it's not part of our effective complement. And so what do we do? We use, we use a learning prosthesis. I introduced that term, didn't really comment on it yesterday, but I hope you'll humor me uh, if I explain it in a little bit more detail. So if we break our foot, if we break a leg, if we, um, if we dislocate our, our shoulder, we make use of physical prostheses. We make use of things like crutches, boots, canes, uh, wheelchairs, slings. And those help us achieve more complete functionality, something closer to full functionality, um, despite our limitations, right? We have a broken leg, but with crutches, we can still get into class. We can still, you know, get in and and um, and get to the physician's office with a cane. We still have a boot, which allows us to get around and, and go to work, um, uh, despite our, our broken foot. Physical limitations demand prostheses that help us behave uh, in ways that are closer to our full functionality. We may still be in some pain, but we can we can still do our job, we can still go to class, et cetera. Models are like cognitive prostheses. We have big limitations in our thinking. You put anyone in front of a complex system, ask them to manage it on the seat of the pants, they'll do very poorly. We build a model of it to understand it. We can actually develop intuitions using the model and develop much more judicious strategies for managing that system, basically head off um, uh, Mis, uh, misjudgments as to how the system will behave, reason it through, and often sharpen, much sharpen our intuition. So models are cognitive or learning prostheses. They help us learn more reliably, more deeply, more quickly, and more effectively from complex system um, than we could unassisted. Um, and I argued yesterday, they're not the truth. They're not crystal balls, but they help speed us towards the truth by also spotting when our thinking just is off base. Because our thinking with a model is brought out of our heads and put into a form that's explicit, that I can show to people, that I can, I can ask what they think. They can offer their comments, they can offer their suggestions, their critiques, and I can use that we can use that collectively 
to advance our thinking about these systems and about how to represent them effectively. We can examine the impacts of different hypotheses. So models, these sorts of models, um, as modest as that first one was, um, can, can serve as learning tools for groups, for teams. But beyond that, they're enactable. And by virtue of enacting it, we can run it and further critique it and further say that behavior is completely unrealistic. Or we could say that behavior is similar to what I used to see, but I don't see it anymore. Um, or I could say it's got some of the right behavior, but this is all. And that leads us to be able to evolve our thinking further as captured in the model. We modify the model so that it behaves in ways that are consistent with what we observe from the world. So the fact that we can enact it means we can know its logical consequences in terms of behavior over time. I said, this model here has logical consequences. What are those consequences? Well, I can run it and I can see them, right? Those are the behavior implied by this model. I can't do it in my head, but I can run it and see, and I can say, is that behavior consistent with what I see from the world? And if not, I can modify the model to get closer, to get closer. It helps spot an inconsistency between what I think might be the case and what is plausible in terms of what it implies as behavior. That, and I wouldn't have spotted that inconsistency without the model to be able to run. If it had just been in my head, I would have been, well, looks to me like a reasonable model. I think it will reproduce these patterns I see in the world, but this allows us to test it. And from that, we modify the model and modify the model, and we get closer to the truth. We, we fail forward. There's an adage more, so um, Francis Bacon, the famous philosopher of, of uh, science said in the mid 1600s, he said, one more quickly finds truth from error than from confusion. And the modern variant of it, I'd say it was roughly like fail early, fail off. In other words, by sitting back and just having ideas in your head, you're not you're not actually advancing your understanding. Um, nothing ventured, nothing gained might be another way to put it. But putting it down in a model, by putting a stake in the sand and saying, I think this is probably a reasonable representation, you can test it. You can run it and see if it's consistent with the data. You can get people to critique it. You can get people's lived experience to comment if the patterns coming out of the model, out of the storytelling module, for example, the model of which Wade spoke, are consistent with their lived experience or consistent with what the community has seen. And if they're not, it's not a failure of the modeling. It's, 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 it's not a failure of the model. It's best viewed as a success of the modeling. Because you wouldn't have found the inconsistency between your thinking and, and people's lived experience without the model. And you advance the model. It's not the model that's important. It's the modeling that's important. It's the movement towards truth that the model represents. And there's a lot of things that don't come out in people's lived experience until you show them something from the model and say, does that look reasonable? How does that compare to your experience? A lot of it is tacit knowledge that they don't think to tap until you show some results from the model and you ask them to comment on it. Models are very good at eliciting people's lived experience that might otherwise not be mentioned by them. They, they're they good at bringing this out, but you need a model to do that. So the model, to, to quote Dwight Eisenhower, the model is nothing, modeling is everything. He didn't say it about model, he said the plan. He said, the plan is nothing, planning is everything. Um, and so it is with these sort of models. Um, the models are there to advance our knowledge as teams. And let me, let me say that, um, 
I think one of the progressions that the modeling field right now is going through, one of the growing pains, and I'm pleased to say this boot camp and my other boot camps are at the forefront of this as well, is a shift in thinking. Time was, I was a young man. I walked in young man's shoes and um, I took pride in, in mastery of the technical aspects of modeling. Uh, and there was a notion of what you needed to do to be a good modeler. And a lot of it was technical mastery of a certain body of knowledge, differential equations and, you know, gradient based modeling, you have to be a good programmer and you needed to be able to understand the underlying mathematics and stochastic systems and all that sort of stuff. And all that's good stuff. I love my students to know that stuff. But the truth is, it's not about modelers. Success is not a function of individual excellence as a modeler. It's, it's a matter of team success. The unit of success in modeling is the team. It's the interdisciplinary or hopefully in their generation's transdisciplinary team that makes success possible. I as a modeler can't do anything without domain experts. I need people like you folks um, to, to help, help me understand the systems we're talking about. Model, the model were the most technical element of the modeling team is just one piece of a bigger system that's needed to achieve success. And one has to approach it as a systems issue. It's teams that are the unit of success. And so it's the ability to work across disciplines and, and at a transdisciplinary level that enables success in this team. So much of what I see now the role of education is being is educating teams. It's not educating individual models. It's educating teams to work effectively across boundaries. You know, when I was when I was seconded and working on the COVID-19 model, it was routine for a given conversation. We might have half a dozen people from different half a dozen different backgrounds represented. Clinical medicine, you know, acute care, ICU care, folks from epidemiology, public health. <laughs> And computer science and and maybe you know uh, a, a, a clinical specialist for infectious disease on the same run. When I'm working with folks in substance use, you might have a dozen different disciplines, right? You might have someone from correction to policing, from social services, from from the side of, of uh, addictions medicine, from from um, yeah, emergency departments, you might have someone who's a primary care physician also involved. You might have people with lived experience of, of, of substance use themselves. You might have people who are, who are social workers all on the same team. And it's not the model, it's the model lane. It's getting those teams to work together effectively. And you may be wondering, like, why are we using the software any logic, for example? Well, one of the big reasons is that we like, I mean, there are all sorts of technical reasons, but one of the big reasons is because we can use it to try to communicate. It's terribly imperfect, it's terribly limited, but we can use it to try to enhance communication between professionals with visual diagrams and so on. And we're gonna see. The, the possibilities, but also the, the limits of this and this boot, boot camp. But it is important to realize that models are not technical documents to be, you know, uh, hoarded over by a white coated, you know, set of priests. They are tools for communication within a team and with people with lived experience and with stakeholders. And it's important that models facilitate those that communication because it's the teams that are the units of success. It's by success of teams that impactful modeling um, gets done and that fixes get put into place that stay fixed. Useful models actually get used.
and it's by storytelling effectively, as Wade talked about. So yesterday, we started with these first modeling, th this first model, this first little model, and we saw it had a lot of implications. We went on the afternoon to experience a bit of model building. And we're not train those who in this next generation will not be the persons with the hands on the keyboard of modeling, but they'll be the model consumers. They'll be the model sponsors. They'll be the model, um, the folks who work to inform the structure of the model with domain expertise. They'll be the folks who or if they'll be the folks who bring stakeholders to refine the models, it's important that they get some experience with what it takes to build the model, that they get some exposure for where the assumptions are, and they get some understanding for what these diagrams mean. I recognize that many people here may not go on and build models, and that's that's good, but seeing what it takes, seeing how the sausage is made, so to speak, um, is probably a good thing um, in order to understand uh, the effort that goes into it, the assumptions that go into it, and the um, uh, and the uh, the ways in which the model pieces collectively allow for you to run scenarios that ask what if questions. Okay, um, so that was the extemporaneous. Um, uh, retrospective for today. Are there any questions or or requests or things you'd like to clarify from yesterday? Maybe maybe my comments stirred them up or maybe they've been simmering overnight and you'd like to ask them. Any any questions uh, you'd like to bring forward? Let's see online. So um, online, any any questions? I'm, I I see chat has materials. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, any any questions from online? Comments? Okay, I'm not seeing any. None in the room right now. Okay, well, 